Uh, now, circumcision was not something that was unknown in the ancient world before Abraham. It's not, it's not the first time it's ever mentioned in, in the world. It's not unique to the Jewish people. There were many cultures in that time that practiced circumcision for different reasons. Uh, in fact, archaeologists have found uh, Egyptian mummies uh, that were circumcised. It's something you can talk about at lunch today, you know, after church, but... So it was a common practice in many cultures, but here for Abraham and his descendants, this now becomes the sign that they have entered into this covenant with their God, Yahweh. It is to be a sign. A sign for who? Well, it's a sign for the person that's been circumcised. And, you know, every time that person who has been circumcised, every time they, they see it, which is going to be a few times a day, they are reminded of their covenant relationship with God and all the promises that God made to them through Abraham that are here in chapter 17. That they have this relationship with God. That God has made these promises to them. That God has entered into a covenant relationship with them. To multiply them. Make a nation of them. And bring kings from them. And to give them the land of, of Canaan. You know in the book of Joshua. When the children of Israel cross over the Jordan River. Into the promised land. If you remember that story. After they cross into the, into the promised land. They enter into the promised land. Now before they. Uh, go to the first city to conquer, the city of Jericho. Do you remember what they do? They circumcise all the men. Right after they cross into the promised land, they stop and they circumcise all of the men. Which was a, you know, which was a very dangerous thing to do because they were vulnerable to attack. Now all of your men, your whole army, you know, they're, they're recovering from surgery uh, and so they're vulnerable to attack from a military standpoint. It was a very good idea to do that procedure after crossing uh, you know, the Jordan River and entering into enemy territory. So then why did they do that? Why do they stop then, of all, you know, at all points, why do they stop to circumcise the men? Because the land was part of the covenant. God promised to give them the land if they kept the covenant, and so they circumcised the men to keep their part of the covenant. They, they weren't hoping in their military. They weren't hoping in their, their military might to gain the land. They were trusting in the promise of God to give them the land as part of this covenant, so they have to do their part. Now, there's a lot we could say about circumcision, <laughs> but we won't. Uh, but let me just say this, in the New Testament, when we get to the New Testament, the emphasis is on spiritual circumcision. The circumcision of the heart. The removal of the flesh, the removal of the sin nature that is in each of our hearts. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11 says, When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with Him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So, so for us, it's, it's a cutting away of the sinful nature. Circumcision of the heart. And in that same passage, passage in Colossians that I just read, there's a parallel made between circumcision and baptism. And so for us, uh, the sign of our covenant with God is water baptism. You know, that's the sign. That's the sign for us. The baptism symbolizes that the old man is dead and buried and that we have new life in Jesus Christ. So there's a, there's a lot more the Bible says about circumcision, but we'll leave it there for now. Verse 15. So then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be 
her name. So Sarah's name is also changed by God. By the way, Sarah is the only woman in the scriptures to have her name changed. And so the promises here, you know, it's important to, to note here, the promise for Abraham is also promise for his wife. You know, Peter talks about how a husband and wife are heirs together of the grace of God. And here, Sarah also is part of this covenant. Her name is changed. Sarai means my princess. Sarah means the princess. In verse 16, we have the blessings of Sarah. Verse 16, and I will bless her and I will give you a son. Look at this, a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. This is the first time that God specified the son would come from Sarah. 24 years they've had this promise. But God has never explicitly said it's going to come through Sarah. That's why they had the whole idea with Hagar. But now God explicitly says it's going to be through Sarah. She's going to have a son. Remember, she's almost 90 years old at this point. Abraham is 99. So then Abraham fell on his face (laughs) and he laughed. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Why can't it just be through Ishmael? And God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. So God gives the name of the son before he's even born. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. So God says that Sarah will have a son and his name will be Isaac and God will establish his covenant with Isaac, not Ishmael. The covenant promises are for Isaac. They're going to go from Isaac from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel. Not through Ishmael. And God says you shall name his name Isaac, which means laughter. Because Abraham laughed when God told him that his wife Sarah would have a baby at their ages. Not that he doubted God. But it just, you know, it was humorous to him that God would do it. You know, and sometimes the way things, the way that God works things out, it, it, just, it just makes you laugh that he would do it this way, you know. Sarah will laugh at the idea too in a couple chapters when she hears, hears that she's going to have a baby at her age, you know. Verse 20 And as for Ishmael, I I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes. We'll see that in chapter 25. And I will make him a great nation, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. You know, there are some some people that say that the covenant was through Ishmael. I don't know how they get that. Because God very clearly says multiple times in this chapter that the covenant is through Isaac. So then he finished talking with him and God went up from Abraham. The dwelling place of God is up. And so Abraham took Ishmael, his son, All who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins. Notice that very same day, as God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised 
with him. I want you to note here that Abraham did not say to God, let me pray about it. Or let me sleep on it. Or let me think about it for a few days. It says that very same day he circumcised the men of his household. His obedience to God was immediate. He didn't put it off. Abraham's belief in the promises of God was proven by his obedience. He, he, he believed that God was going to multiply him exceedingly, make him exceedingly fruitful, that nations would come from him, kings would come from him, that he's going to give him all of this land of Canaan. He, he believed it so much that he immediately got up and obeyed God. And his obedience shows his faith. His obedience shows his faith. If we believe God's word, if we believe it's true, if we believe his promises are true, we're going to obey. It's, it's that simple. If we believe his word, if we believe his promises, we'll be, we'll be obedient and we'll be quick to obey. We're not going to be wishy-washy about it. It's not going to be the kind of thing, well, let me think about it. I don't know. and Let me pray. Oh, no. I, I, I believe his promises are true. And so I'm going to be quick to obey.